Hey everyone, welcome to the Tom's Hardware Podcast for May 31st, 2022. As always, I'm Tom's Hardware Editor-in-Chief, Abram Pilch. I am joined by Associate Editor Les Pounder, Raspberry Pi expert Ash Hill, and our very special guest, Pimaroni's Chris Parrott, who is the mind behind uh, all the robots that Pimaroni makes and the code for them and amazing things like the Trillabot that I have here and uh, a lot of other robots that he has behind uh, him. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, Chris. You're welcome. Uh, can you tell folks a little bit about yourself and how long you've been working with Pimaroni? Uh, yeah, I've um, like been work been interested in robotics for quite a long time, like probably since a kid, like um, films like Short Circuit, Batteries Not Included and things like that. Um, and that's kind of been my career goal. I want to make robots. Um, only really been working with Pimeroni for about a year, but um, I kind of got to talking to them and knowing them a bit before that, and they liked the stuff I was doing with robots and kind of wanted to have me on board to like, bring some ideas to market. Wow, really, really cool. So what are you responsible for it at Pimeroni? Do you design the hardware, the software, all of the above? A bit of everything. So my actual official title is product engineer. My business cards do now say robot builder on them as well. <laughs> but um, So that sort of involves pretty much the entire uh, cycle of development from uh, coming up with the initial concepts in some cases. So I've pitched various ideas mm -hmm. um, to doing the circuit design and the PCB routing to um, testing the first prototypes and to actually doing the so the customer facing software at the end of it. Wow, really cool. Yeah. How do you guys decide when it's time to make a new design a new robot? Is there a product cycle where you say we have to do a new robot every so often? Or do you just kind of come up with ideas and say, okay, I want to pursue this? Uh, a lot of it is very much just what's exciting and cool to us. So I'd say some ideas are things I've pitched. I, oh, I generally, if I've had to make a product myself, like a like cobble together something in a breadboard, chances are that makes sense as an all-in-one product. So I uh, sometimes end up pitching those ideas, and like they get picked up and then added to the the schedule uh, for development. What are some of your favorite elements that you like to put into robotics? Like, do you prefer spider legs that crawl or wheels or certain kinds of ultrasonic <laughs> sensors? Uh, yeah, I, I'm very much into walking robots. Um, I know they can, like spiders and things can be creepy, but I kind of love the mechanics involved and the um, like to make them walk well. Um, I mean, you can see I've got multiple walkers right here. L little one here, for instance. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are any of those Pimeroni kits, uh, or are they going to be? Uh, no, none of them. Uh, I don't think we've had those discussions, actually. Uh, they're perhaps maybe a bit too niche, or at least like there's a lot of cost involved because for walking robots, you need a lot of servos. And to get yeah. good quality ones, you're, you're talking several hundred pounds as a starting price, which is a bit high as an entry point for some people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen some selling kits selling on Amazon for I don't know a hundred hundred and fifty dollars, but on the other hand, you know, they're I'm sure they're not the best quality, the kind of quality that Pimeroni would have because Pimeroni does not never comes out with junk. You know, like every <laughs> every Pimeroni thing that I've ever tested is is good quality, like good materials, good build quality, good good documentation. So, you know, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. But walking robots is kind of where the Servo 2040 we, um, came from, which I think you've covered already. Oh, yeah, that's a great board to play around with. That's the one I connected the continuous servo to and drove a little car on my desk. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. I kind of did it when I started designing it. I didn't initially consider them as a use case. And then as I was writing the software, it's like, oh, yeah, there's, there's those. There's linear actuators as well. So I added the support in the library for them, which I don't think you're using that support. You're just driving it as a server. You pretty Abram, much, yeah. yeah. Abram touched on build quality, and that, that had a, another question about um, specifically kits for Pimeroni. Mm -hmm. We've 
We've had issues before with some robotic kits that have plastic parts. They kind of fall apart. And I'm not talking about 3D printed stuff because that's a whole nother game. Depends on what you're printing with and the settings you use there. What do you think is the best material to use for frames when it comes to robotics, especially walking ones? Uh, I mean, the a lot of the ones I've used, I've done it with metal, but we've been having really good results with um, FR4 as in PCB material. So that's what mm -hmm. Trilobot's made of. And not only is it really sturdy material for the thickness and you can get different thicknesses as well it yeah. lets you add circuitry onto the board um either for lights or actual sensors and things which is really quite valuable and like i don't think even though we've got laser cutting in-house that we can do and obviously we make pyro cases and things um I, I think for this kind of stuff we'd stick with the circuit board solution that's what I like about Trailer Bot. It's, it's just like a, a massive hat that you just stick the pie straight yeah. on. Yeah. It's yeah. Like a way to go. My son was very impressed. The thing now that I have to figure out how to do with my Trailer Bot is how the best way to kind of to attach some uh, to attach some of the some of the add-on boards because mm -hmm. I would love to take some of my uh, some of my boards here and put them on as sensors and things like that. Yeah. things like that. I think I'm going to have to do some some major soldering here. But yeah, so the, the, those connectors were kind of a thing I pushed because we didn't want to add them on, like pre solder them on and for people who didn't want that or the extra cost involved because it requires um, some manual placement involved in that. Um, but we wanted to at least give the, the pinholes there for people who wanted to be a bit more adventurous. Yeah, I mean, I have I have a lot of those little ports, so I would... Uh... Get probably get good use out of them in the better use out of them in the robot than in uh, than in a, a, the regular hat that I have for them because you know you can have it rolling around with those sensors. So I think I think that's pretty cool. I think definitely having a robot that's not made out of acrylic is good. We mm -hmm. have I see a lot of acrylic robots and I really don't like acrylic because it it's so fragile. It seems to snap way too way too easily and then you end up with like just one broken piece and you're you'd have to you buy know. a whole nother kit at that point yeah a whole other kit yeah. or there's or like you have to shove a little tiny acrylic uh nut into a little tiny acrylic hole and oh yeah i hate that so you know i i, I love the design of the trillabot because it because it's made out of this hard material and it's not it's not cheap acrylic yeah. Okay. Plus, it lets us do really nice things with the artwork, like I'm sure you've seen on the top. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I took it apart. Don't worry. I, that. <laughs> I don't know how many people have noticed the underside uh, option for the top plate. <laughs> That's very true. I like the lights underneath. You've got so yeah. few LEDs on it, but it just shines so yeah. brightly. It's just gorgeous to see it flying around. That really... That really impressed my ten-year-old. Yeah, he he loved it. He loves the under the undercarriage lights. So. Yeah, Pimaroni is all about uh, the lighting. Oh yeah, I mean the the first add on board they produced, I think it was was it Pi Glow. Yes, and that was yeah, that was. I did have one, but I've lost it. Unfortunately, it was tiny, um, like a little spiral of LEDs, multiple LEDs. Lovely little board. Yeah. That was all. Back, I think that was back in 2013, 2014. And that yeah. came out. That's an old one. But talking of little it. boards, you've got something new for the Pico. I know it's um, the motor shim. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I I quite like the look of this because mm -hmm. it, it's it's a bit different to something else. Can you tell us a bit more about motor shim? Oh, here we yeah. go. <laughs> so yeah, it's a just a little um, add-on board for the Pico. You can either solder it directly or um, like put it with um, headers like I've got here. So you see the actual Pico is up here and then the boards yeah. underneath. Um, put it in and it gives you two motors, a Quest connector and a button to let you do some little, very small robots. Nice. So at the minute, what Pico is powering out? Is it a, a tiny? Uh, no, this is just the normal, regular Pico. You can kind of see the full length oh, of yeah. it there. Oh, yeah. Um, that yeah. too. You could probably, with the hack, I think, I forget where I saw it, but where the hack, um, where you can cut down the length of it, Yeah, you could probably make an even smaller robot. <laughs> it only uses the top end pins, so all those other pins you could, you don't need for it. 
Yeah, that's what I like because you fit it on the underside of the Pico, just solder it on. I'm looking yeah. at Perimoni's uh, site right now, just at the pictures, and it just sandwiches on upside down, and you're ready to go. You haven't got to mess around with any wires, and even the motor connections are like a proper connection. Yes, yeah, so these are the same connections we use uh, we use for Trilobot. So it's the the now we sell the motor standalone. So if you did want to um, like change the gear ratio on uh, Trilobot, you can do now. Yeah. And if you need replacement cables, we sell them as well because of this. Nice. And also the Quest connection, so the stem QT, um, yeah. quick connection. You're ready to go with plug-in sensors, and you can daisy chain as many sensors as you want. And oh, what have you got? So this Time is something we're hopefully launching in the next few days. <gasps> so this is the um, like time of flight sensor, but it's an 8 by 8 grid, ah, which lets you uh, actually do some quite clever object tracking. So you'll I see think I've seen Phil messing around with this on uh, Twitter. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I've got the space on the desk to show it, but because uh, this is also using a LiPo shim. For the battery power. Mm. Um, nice. See if it actually. Oh, yep. Don't know if you can see it in frame. Yeah. Just. Just. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that so is cool. How would you say that differs from? I mean, there's another breakout garden time of flight sensor. I think I actually have it in a drawer here. How would you say this differs from the old one and from an ultrasonic using an ultrasonic sensor? Well, it's the fact that it gives you basically a low resolution image. So in that case, it was actually it wasn't just it was just it wasn't just going forward and backwards. It was actually following the paper. So it was actually steering to follow it because it knows the x and y coordinates of that the, basically the closest object, mm -hmm. and you can like go use the distance to say oh it's too close reverse or it's too far go forward. Whereas the um, normal time of flights um, only give you a single point with like a very narrow field. Um, and so you'd need multiple of them set up to kind of give you the same effect. Ultrasounds give you a wider field, but it's still only one object or at least the close, closest object. You can't tell, oh, there's an object more on my left or, or more on my right with it. Ah, I see. Very cool. That is cool. We've got yeah. a lot of makers that like to make their own robots from scratch. And obviously projects like this are really inspiring. So what tools and applications do you like to use? And that could be for designing chips or designing the frames. I know you mentioned you guys have a laser cutter you use. What, what would you recommend? Uh, so I've got really into Fusion 360 for doing my 3D modeling. Um, I use that both for if I'm doing something for 3D printing or laser cutting. Like There's tool plugins you can get that just export a, a 3D thing as a flat object. So you can send it to the machine. Um, for circuit boards, we uh, we use Eagle. Uh, well, I've used it personally as well. Um, for so because it has some integration with Fusion, although I don't really use that much. Um, of course, there's KiCad and what have you um, circuit board designs that I've not used. Um, then coding wise, I mean, I use VS Code for developing my programs in whatever language I need. Very cool. Yeah. I've used yes. a couple of those, but I haven't actually played around with Eagle, you said? Yes. I'm used to people using KiCad because it's it's open source. Is Eagle open source? Uh, no, so it, is, it isn't, sadly. But it makes sense for what we do at work, and I, I learned it for the job, basically. Cool. I think I used something um, by RS Components before, like Design Spark, I think it's called. Um, that's why I've done circuit boards in the past with. Uh, is that the online tool from our, from our No, it's a, uh, maybe it's online now, but it certainly wasn't back when I used it. Mm. And it was free. I don't think it was open source, but it was a bit more open licensed than Eagle. Yeah. Yeah. So, so <laughs> what are some of the things that you're looking forward to? What are some of the things that you would like to see Pimeroni come out with? Do you, um, that you know, without yeah. breaking too many secrets, what are some? Well, of the I was going to say I can't really talk about many of those because the things I want them to come out with, we're doing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm de definitely trying to cater to the broad spectrum of uh, robot robot enthusiasts, from like the beginners 
to the advanced people who need like a big driver board to drive something like this, for example, and um, sort of cover that whole range because um, like you end up having to DIY a solution sometimes for those and it would just be nice to have a ready-made board that will do what you want. Yeah. So I try to be aware of what the community um, wants in products. Obviously, a lot of it's based on my own experience of, oh, if only there was this thing, but I try to be open to other ideas. So one thing at the moment um, I've been playing about with is the um, it's McCannon wheels. I don't know if you've covered them on the show before, maybe on the Pi Wars uh, talk a bit, a bit ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are, uh, we sell these on um, our store, but these are little wheels that go at, basically let you go in any direction when you drive them with the correct way. And this was my uh, contraption using a PGA 2040 on a custom board to drive six motors with encoders. Yeah. Yeah. And this was, for, oh, sorry. We, we covered that story, in fact, when it came out. Oh, yes. Were... Yeah, I built it and then like, didn't write the software for a year because they ended up writing the software for work. Uh, so, yeah, we've, we've now got um, motor and, and encoder support in our MicroPython builds for the Raspberry Pi Pico, which means I can now use it in my own hobby. Uh, <laughs> well, that's how it should work, right? I mean, yeah. that's how it should work. You you figure things out uh, that you want to do, and then you make them part of your job. I know we, we all do that. Uh, we all do that here. So Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I, but yeah, I, sorry, I was um, um yeah. yeah, kind of started from this. So this is more your traditional setup with like four um, four wheels, and this is sort of using a stack of boards, as you can see, and it's sort of DIYs. Yeah. Um, so kind of, I'm allowed to tease another product we've been working on, um, which sort of addresses that, and it's the um, it's this thing that we're calling it Motor Twenty Forty. So following the name of Servo 2040 here. Ooh, and it's nice. an all-in-one board that lets you drive four motors with encoders. So you can drive, basically can turn this into this. Is that, that looks USB -C? very awesome. Say again, Ash? Is that USB-C? Yes, USB-C. Um, okay. You can uh, add external power as well, and it'll run off uh, batteries, single LiPo, whatever you want. Very good. Um, but yeah, it makes it very easy to make something like this or like perhaps something a bit more, like a bit more weird, like this. Huh. Well, I'm liking oh, that. Oh, I like that one. So what's the onboard motor controller for that? Uh, it's the uh, DRV88. 3.3, which is the same one on the Pico oh. motor shim, actually. Just we've adjusted it to um, support higher current. Yeah. Oh, classic. And, and there's option to even remove the current limit if you want to provide your own battery source. Oh, brilliant. Is that like a, a solderless, like a solder point? You can just bridge a solder joint or something. Yeah, you can just see them on the back there. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's sort of kind of, kind of the kitchen sink of options on the rear. That's great. So that's a whole platform just in, in one little board ready to go. So, I mean, in the past, I've done robots with Pis, and it's, you know, Raspberry Pi, Explorer hat, or, an, you know, L298 remote uh, controller. Then this, then that, and sensors. Just that makes it so much simpler. Plugging stuff in there, like, oh. Yeah. So it's got two sensor headers, and um, so a bit like the ones on Server 2040, and you've got your quick uh, STEM QT connector as well. Always yeah. useful. Yeah. And I've got a question for the audience from Lee. Are there any plans for mini sumo platforms maybe powered by the Pi Pico? It's certainly something we've been talking about. Um, I am not as familiar with the space um, as I'd want to be um, in terms of what would actually make a good product for that community. Obviously, you can make something quite small with uh, motors and wheels, but it's like how do you actually make a good sumo robot, for instance? Um, that's something I'm definitely open to um, feedback on if people have it. So do you see someone using a robot like that completely autonomously? Because I, 
I don't because it, I don't think there's a way, an easy way for you to add Bluetooth or wireless connectivity to it, right? Well, so yeah, it's, it, there's nothing like that on there, but um, we have broken out on this uh, top edge the uh, UART. So if you want to use a Bluetooth serial module, then that gives you an option, and that's something I've done before. So this, for example, uses Bluetooth serial, and I connect to it with a phone app, and it works absolutely fine for what I need. So and it's like simple to control. Nice. Which Bluetooth you are? Is it HC05 or six? Uh, I think it's the five. They both those numbers sound familiar to me. <laughs> but I've been sorry. I've been messing around with myself with those uh, modules for a little project of a multimeter to do mm. Bluetooth. But yeah, they're, they're cheap and they're powerful. So if you can get yeah. it working with a little robot, brilliant. Yeah. So that was one of the things that we had a few pins spare um, left over on this versus the. Servo 2040 as well. Well, we could either just add them up to more LEDs or actually a usable port on the edge. Um, like you could, it's the pinout matches um, the ultrasound sensors as well, although it isn't five volts. So you'd need to add something in between for that if it's not a five, a three volt compatible module. Kevin said Kevin. Bluetooth, yeah. Bluetooth <laughs> on motor 2040 is pretty straightforward. Yeah. He's drooling uh, over those robots in the comments. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah he's, he's excited, although he likes to make robotic heads, yeah. uh, robotic robotic faces. Yeah, well, he, uh, he's, 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 been, he's been teased with this before, so he has been he knows it's coming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no question about it. I kind of wanted to ask about some of the things on your shelves back there. They look oh, really yeah. cool. What are the, uh, what are all those multicolored things on your, on your bottom shelf? Oh, this, um, oh, no, these are, so this is, these are purely little models I found on Thingiverse from a video game I like, but they're um, just 3D prints, but um, of basically all the different filaments I got. When I was starting out with the, my own 3D printer, I just like wanted a small print to test them all and just printed out the same thing and then made a stand to put them on and it kind of gives them a nice rainbow. It looks good. What yeah. about that big spider bot on your table? I, I see big legs. Oh, oh yeah, this thing. This is a. Uh, this is a. I think it's ten years old now. Oh my goodness! I didn't realize that top part was part of it. Yeah, it's. Um, pretty oh. cool. Is that how you get to work? Do you ride how that? How much does it weigh? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> I don't know wow. the actual weight, but multiple kilograms. <laughs> wow. Yeah, this um, this was basically my second robot I built ever. After this being, this was my first, which is like an Arduino kit that I added loads of sensors on. And then I thought, oh, simple progression. Make, yeah, clearly. Jump from that to a hexapod. So <laughs> what's driving easy. the hexapod? What's what's the brains behind it? Well, this this basically predates the Raspberry Pi in most ways. Mm. So there's an Arduino Mega at the top, and then there's a like a servo driver board in the middle mm. that's also programmable that does all the um, the commands. So you sort of have to have the the Arduino sort of does the high level logic, and then the servo board converts that into here's what the actual angles need to be. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, there's there's a video of it like in its early days on my YouTube channel, um, but it's one of those projects where I come back to it every now and uh, then when there's some new technology or new board that um, I can do. So one of the things I'd like to do relating to RP2040 is, like I did on this with the PGA2040, yeah. is um, like make a custom board that replaces the servo driver on here with an RP2040. Uh, give it all the pins that this needs because I'm not going to replace a lot of this. So there's some sort of legacy requirements that don't make sense if you're doing a new product, but do for this. Yeah. And of course, we've already got the servo support in the libraries now, so it would get it working. It would be quite easy to get working, and then put like a proper Raspberry Pi in the top to replace the Arduino. Well, do you have a name for it? Uh, no, I'm terrible with robot names. It was only ever called Project Infuser, and that's like the extent of it. I'm yeah, just terrible. <laughs> so Kevin asks, uh, "What's your favorite robot?" I mean, it has to be this, to be honest, because this was sort of um, 
about a year and a half of initial development, like buying a few parts a month. Mm-hmm. And I learned so much on it. And in fact, it's one of the pieces of evidence I used um, in order to get onto my uh, uh, PhD, where I, uh, where I actually did like learn proper robotics. That's so they, because they were, they was like, well, you've got a computer science background. You want to make, do some hardware things. What proof have you got? And I just showed them this. Well, that's proof. What are the legs made of? Is that yeah. metal? Yeah, so it's a combination of um, just like aluminium strips cut down and curved and uh, some kit pieces from a company called Lynx Motion. I, do, I think they're still around, but they were really big at the time uh, making all these parts. And you can, I think you still get a lot of it from Robot Shop. Great. That's so cool. So speaking of controllers, Les, you have a new RP2040 board that uh, that is somewhere between an RP2040 and a micro bit that could be used in robots? Yeah, it's unusual on this one. So we're used to seeing the RP2040 in a standard board, like a dip package that fits into a breadboard. Just plugs in and away we go. But this was something that I saw a couple of weeks ago. So I picked one up for a play around. So it's called PicoEd. And it's done by Elec Freaks. It's about $13. It's an RP2040 in a microbit version 2 form factor. Now, it doesn't have the same features as a microbit, but it has close enough. So it's got a speaker on. It's got the same connections for crocodile clips or alligator clips, what we call in America. Um, it's got an RP2040. It's got a battery input. It's got a USB, micro USB input. It's got a, I think, 17 by 7 screen. And you can mess around really easy with it. So you can see on the screen there's a pin out on the right hand side. Ooh. I've not confirmed completely, but I'm about 95% certain that the pin out matches the micro bit. So you could put this in micro bit accessories. And as long as you can write the software, you can get it to talk with those accessories, including robot kits. Ooh. And you can mess around and have a lot of fun with this. So I have. So on the bench, the sun's coming out now. You can see it's late evening sun in the UK. It's ruining my shot. But anyway, there's Pico Ed, and there's a Microbit B2 next to it. So you can see they are pretty close in size and in looks. But this has been programmed right now. I'm going to go to Fonny. Let's go to my screen capture so you can see as well. I've put the Pico Ed library on, so that's the first line. I've also got the line on for working with the GPIO. U times control the speed of the code. Pin 26 on the RP2040 works out to be pin zero on the micro bit, which is the big pin on the left here. So I'm saying that if a button is pressed, play some music. If button B is pressed, scroll something on the screen and then to make the light turn on three times. Now you're going to think, Les, where's the light? Well, seamless little segue there. This is a breakout board from Fortronics called the Bit 170. It was out a couple of years ago. And I've wired up an LED to it just for a quick test. So if I go to Fonny now and I just start the code, there it goes, it's running. So if I press the A button now, she's the left hand side. You can hear the music playing. On, on board speaker, you can connect an external speaker to this via the crocodile clips, and you can make it really loud. Trust me, I've done this in a classroom with 30 <laughs> kids. It's great fun. Scrolling text. So there's the PyCast scrolling across. It's not as slick as the microbit scroll, but it's, it's good enough. And there's the LED flashing. So I've proven to some degree that it has compatibility with microbit accessories. But what I want to do is delve through my box of microbit stuff and this is where I show you the box of microbit stuff that I've got. I have multiple boxes in my place. This is just microbit add-on boards. Ooh. Yeah, I haven't got banana for scale, sorry. <laughs> uh, but that's just add-ons for like NeoPixels, motors, all that sort of jazz. I'm going to have a mess around with that and see if I can get it to work with some accessories so I can tell you all about it in the review. But so far, for £13, so $13, it's good. Is it better than <laughs> microbit version 2? Well, here's the thing. I'm missing the accelerometer. I'm missing a speaker. And those are sort of killer features for microbit. So the accelerometer on a microbit, you tilt it around and it, you, know, you can control things. You can have radio connections 
on a macro. It's all macro, it's a radio connection there. That's not on PicoEd. If you have two micro bits of radio, you can use this to steer another one connected to a robot, which is great fun. And this is, is about the same price. Is that matrix one color or are they RGB? Uh, one single color, unfortunately. That's why we didn't see disco. That's why I didn't see disco. No, <laughs> no disco. It's not multicolor. No disco. But micro bit is also one color. So it is. Yeah. It's no, uh, it's no diff. It's no different, but. So. No, it would have been nice to have seen NeoPixels. You can get NeoPixels that small. There's um, an ESP32 board from 01 Space that I was playing around with about a month ago. And that has absolutely tiny, about one millimeter square NeoPixels on it. And it is a gorgeous little screen. I did disco on that, of course. And that's even smaller. In fact, I've got the another version of it here. This is an RP2040 version with an OLED. Let's get it the right way around. In fact, let's use a camera that I've set up for overhead shots. There we go. So you can see it. That's got a tiny OLED screen. It's an RP2040 and it's got a Quest connection. It's wow. very cute. But the screen on this is OLED, but on the um, RP, sorry, the ESP32 version, it's a 5x5 five five grid of NeoPixels. It's gorgeous. I would have loved to have seen that on PicoEd, but that would have put the price up a lot. So... We can live with this. It's made for education, not for dazzling people on a show. I still can't get over how small that screen is. Yeah. And it's razor sharp as well, which is scary. It <laughs> used to be that when you had, oh, I, I, I have to ask Chris this. How many, how do you decide what, when you're just have an idea for a robot, do you, how do you decide what board to make, to build it around? Like, obviously you've now you've gone from just regular Raspberry Pi to, to RP2040 boards, do you decide, hey, I want to do what, this one to be an Arduino one and this one to be a microbit one, or do you just decide whatever's kind of the best board at the time? Uh, yeah, generally best board at the time. I do have a soft spot for the Teensy C lineup of boards because they're mm -hmm. Arduino compatible but have a lot of processing power. Um, and then uh, obviously really small so you can fit them when I sit onto a strip board. Um, but generally, I mean, when I'm doing a robot, it's often based around some thing I want to try, or there's like a new product, like a laser scanner or something I want to do. And that sort of started the robot. And then everything else sort of falls out from that, of even the shape and things come from that. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Speaking of things that you can do with your boards, Ash, you have been tracking how you can how you can tell uh, the weather with your with your board. Oh yeah, I mean, we've had some crazy weather here lately. My plants love it, but I want to know what to expect because how can you take your robot out for a walk if it's gonna rain, right? So I figure there's gotta be a way to do it on the Raspberry Pi. And it turns out there's tons of ways to do it on the Raspberry Pi, but I want to focus on one really cool dashboard that I found. I came across this beautiful weather station app that combines everything you want into one web-based user-friendly dashboard. I'm actually following a tutorial put together by Core Electronics. You should definitely go check out their website and their YouTube channel. They have a detailed explanation of how to set everything up. But what I want to do today, since we're a little pressed for time, is just give you an overview of how it goes together so you can see how easy it is to get started. So let me switch over to my display. I've got Raspberry Pi OS running on a virtual machine here because that's just a little bit easier for me to share on the podcast. So. Let's see if you hear my dog barking in the background. Sorry about that. She's excited about this weather station. So it's all based around this GitHub repository created by um, a fellow, or I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Elwin. Elwin. Uh, if you look up Pi Weather Station GitHub over at Google, it should be the first result. It uses a few open source tools that you'll need to create an account with in order to generate some API keys that the dashboard needs to use, but they're all completely free to use and they give all sorts of cool data that we're gonna use. So once you install this and get it set up, it opens in a browser window, and this is what it looks like. Here we go. So on the left, you can see a beautiful weather map overlaid with some blue splotches, and these blue splotches represent rainfall. At the moment where I live, it's sunny, which is awesome. I'm happy to be out of the blue. And on the right, you can see location data. I have it set to Johnson City, Tennessee, which is a little ways away from where I live, but it's close enough for a general idea of my location, so I can get an idea of what's going on around me. You can set the latitude and longitude in the settings, and the 
Pi Weather Station will remember that next time you launch it, which is really useful. You don't want to have to drag the map around every time you want to check the weather. And you'll also notice some data for both a 24-hour period and a seven-day prediction. Looks like maybe some rain's coming up around Sunday or Monday, but that's okay. Thanks to the Pi Project, I can plan ahead. So what do you guys think? Raspberry Pi Weather Station, yay or nay? Does your house need one? That's very cool. I like yes. that. That is a nice web interface. It's all it's how sweltering uh, it is over here because it's getting kind of humid right now. My shirt said that my <laughs> button-up shirt because it's here in, here in New York, it's very humid. So yeah, I would 